Women Today, brought to you by CityWing.com, for your next flight away. Hello and welcome to the Women Today podcast. This week we've met some incredible people, from an eight-year-old girl who raises money for charity and writes poetry, to the women who've cared for someone with Parkinson's. It's stories like these that this programme is all about. And this afternoon we're talking about the importance of outdoor play for children and are joined by the Play and Play Work Development Officer at the Children's Centre, Chris Gregory, and Jenny Quaggan and Evelina Baltarovic. Have I said it right? Perfect. I'm only saying it once, OK? Um, and you both recently organised an outdoor conference. Um, now, Jenny, you were talking about what the conference focused on and the opportunities that there are for children to play outside um, in the Isle of Man. But why do we need a conference about that? Surely we all know what's out there. We do. There, there tends to be a... Children seem to stay indoors much more um, because of Xboxes and things like that. But it, it's not just about that. It's about the fact that parents work longer hours, um, so children are often into childcare. We've done some research which showed that actually children under the age of 11 tend to play outside more than the ones at 11 and over, which was quite an interest. The ones at 11 and over tend to use devices more. But isn't that just an age thing? I mean, I would have thought that was quite a natural progression almost in a child's life. It possibly is. Um, It's the fact that that many children don't get to play outdoors other than school. And that's one of the things that we wanted to try and get across was that actually children can go out any time. You know, weekends, evenings, it's... Yeah, but then there's obviously the schoolwork. There's things that all constrain that as well. So, Chris, I wonder if you um, have an idea or can give us an idea of how play has changed over the years. I mean, Jenny's referred to the things that you've got the the Xboxes and the consoles and whatever that pe- children tend to be drawn to. But are we so different from years ago? I think children all over the world, no matter where they are, you know, they will naturally go and play. It's what opportunities are available to them. So, we, I mean, we've, we've rightly said that the Isle of Man is a wonderful place for children to go outside and to play. But the reality of it is that for many children, they're not getting out as much as they have done in previous generations. So I think this rise in uh, the use of, of, of social media and technology is just compensatory. They, they're doing that in place of the opportunities that they previously had. Um, and, and there's a reason what I believe the reason to be behind why they aren't going outside is a, a change in social values into into what we think is acceptable and what children's role is within society. You know, in the, in the past it's been very welcoming or more welcoming for children to be outside and playing. And now it's not, you know, with the bylaws that prevent, well, not necessarily prevent, but they're in place uh, that, that could be used to prevent children. We don't condone that. They're not welcome on the streets. There's a rise in traffic and congestion, you know, and there's m- much more concern about dangers that, that the children face. But many of the dangers are still the same that they've always been. But attitudes have changed and as a result of that the culture's changed and children's culture's changed to the point where it is very much more insular on a a computer of some kind. Now Evelina, you are originally from Poland, you've been on the island for over 10 years now and you have a daughter who's five. Um, Obviously you don't have any experience of bringing her up in Poland but I wonder what the differences are between the Isle of Man and Poland in terms of children getting out to play? Uh, What I remember from Poland as a child will be probably the same as you all remember but every time when I visit Poland now, when we try to go once or twice a year, uh, you see kids playing in the purpose-built playground, adults supervised. I can't see kids playing outdoors as I used to do. And uh, I was brought up in the city centre, but even still, we went outside, we found a piece of green and we just played there. I can't see any kids doing it anymore. But I suppose, Chris, you've, you've referred to things like traffic and, and the other issues, and parents and guardians surely they're right to be a little bit cautious sometimes yeah you know the, the 100% right to be to be conscious of, of, of traffic but what are we doing as a society to still give children the opportunities to go outside and play I don't blame the parents but I do blame perhaps the wider issue and, and parents are part of that we're, we're all part in, of developing the culture that we we are we're in now um and for some reason, and uh, various reasons, we've brought bits into this culture that we've developed that is very restrictive on children's play. And what can we do to to give children the opportunities that they can access? 
Chris, I hear what you're saying, and I agree with what you're saying, but I do really believe that from the difference of myself growing up compared to my own children growing up is the fact that we've got so many gadgets around now that makes it that much more attractive for a child to stay indoors. So iPad, Xboxes. I even have seen it where you've got um, youngsters out in the streets and you can see that maybe they've been thrown outside to play, but they're on their phones outside. You know, and um, I struggled with the concept last year because I wanted uh, my kids to be out out a bit more and then they allowed maybe Peel to have outside Wi-Fi and I couldn't quite believe it for free and I just wanted you know to actually get these children out of technology um, you know but I find it's just as a kid growing up it must be so much more attractive to stay indoors and play on the Xbox. Well yeah if you, if you look at so let's say we'll let's let our, streets, uh, our children out onto the streets to play now the roads are obviously much busier so they're not going to play in the traditional places where they used to play so one of the first places we've done a survey with like 4,000 children on the Isle of Man and the first place that those children want to play is right outside their immediate home they want to play on the streets but they can't so what do we do we have these compensatory playgrounds that are just quite naff to be honest and and Children don't want to play in there. They're very limited. There's only so much you can do. A real playground for real children would look like a bomb site because that's where children want to play. There's a brilliant movement in the UK, and it's, it's, it's a very old movement, but it's, it's coming back into fashion now, called Adventure Playgrounds. And these are scraps of land that are filled up with wood and hammers and nails, and the children take it, and they build their own playground, and they can use fire there they can use water they have access to all this and the number of accidents hardly anything nothing at all and certainly nothing serious jenny how good are you at getting your boys out to play mine are actually quite good at going out to play particularly my youngest um they're all very different my, my eldest is very rarely in the house these days as a 15 year old um but my youngest who's nine he he's hardly in he he loves just to be out playing and being out with his friends and cycling and going on little adventures uh the the middle one tends to be a little bit more in tune with his gadgets um now i don't think that's necessarily an age thing i think it's just the difference in some children i think he just prefers that type of socialization to, um just feels more at home with it so i think there are differences in children as well it's not just necessarily that, that they're not encouraged um because they they do have the freedom to go out but I'm interested in something that you, you said earlier as well, Jenny, about um, more children are in childcare nowadays mm. because maybe both parents go out to work. And I just worry because there's a, an awful lot of guilt associated with this as well because you feel you're not doing the right thing for your children. I mean, sometimes you feel like you can't do right for doing wrong. Yes, yeah, I would agree. And I think, particularly with my eldest, I went through that in terms of I, I worked full time at, at that at that time and he would be in childcare from sort of eight till six and uh, I would feel guilty and, and particularly when he was probably four or five I, w I would encourage him to go to clubs I would have him enrolled in all different things and it's it's only as I've progressed and, and researched more into childhood play that actually I've, I've realised that all those clubs and activities that we tend to put on children seem to actually have a neg more of a negative effect because it just constrains their time even more and they don't necessarily want to do it. <laughs> It's us as parents that feel guilty. OK, then, Chris, what exactly is good play? Oh, crikey. <laughs> um, well, let's, let's understand that, that play isn't just this idyllic image that we all tend to have of children kicking a ball about or climbing a tree. That is not play. I don't think there's any such word as good play. There's good play, there's bad play. There's, there's I think Brian Sutton-Smith determined that there were 320-odd different types of play that children can actually partake in. What is good is when children are given the time and the space to play without adults interfering, without having the threat of cars, and when they're just given that time and space. And that's predominantly what, what allows children the opportunity to flourish and to get the best out of their play experience. Because, and this is something I think is really important, is that we, we pigeonhole play into, and we, we subscribe it into very small pockets of of the day but us as adults we play all the time we had a, a very fun conversation upstairs and we could because we were playing earlier you know as you get older and i just say joe doesn't play very nicely <laughs> i know because she was pulling my hair <laughs> but but we we our play changes as we get older and so you will find that that by the time um joe would say same age as, you, as your child now he's at that age now where He's going to be, he's not going to want to necessarily climb the trees. It is more of a social thing. And so I know we had a conversation about him using Xbox and Xbox Live. And, and he w you said that he was 
communicating with his friends that way. And that is one of the, the way, main ways that, that lots of children do communicate with each other because they can't get outside or they're not allowed to go outside. We well, just need a longer extension lead and have the Xbox outside. Oh, no? oh my goodness <laughs> yes. me. I mean, this is the thing. I, I was going to say, so do you sit comfortably with the fact that your middle son enjoys to socialise and be on his gadgets more? Does that sit comfortably with you? It does, actually. It, it's it's took a while. I must admit, initially, I was I was sort of, again, the the idea of like, oh, you know, I need to get him out. and But I've learned that, actually, no, that's how he socialises, so... It's very much about him. It's, it's his way of. Can I moving. just say though, I, I I I know Jenny's middle son, <laughs> and he's, he's a cracking a cracking lad, and he, he goes to um, the children's centre after school club, and he does play, and yes. he's he's a very imaginative child who will use hammers and nails, and he does build the most amazing dens as well. So I think it's very important that we get this right. That when I don't think Jenny or myself are condoning that children solely use computers. That is not the way we we want this to go whatsoever we're saying actually it's a compensatory measure that children are using as a result of not being able to play outside but when they get outside or when they they're, they're put together not necessarily leaving outside they will do so much more four years ago we received the phone call from alder hay children's hospital that confirmed our six-year-old daughter had celiac disease two weeks earlier she had a biopsy following positive blood tests in that interim period our reaction had changed from total devastation to one of relief as the months of migraines, bloating, tummy ache, joint aches, vomiting, anemia and fevers could be treated without medication by just eating the right food and eliminating the bad. Suddenly we were catapulted into a world of driving around the island to source food from Tesco, M&S, the co-op and ShopRite, reading labels with writing too small to spot with the naked eye. We became very adept at spotting gluten in the ingredients at less than 20 paces. Bringing up a child with celiac disease is not without its challenges, of course, and often those challenges are down to the very nature of children and their lifestyles, and overwhelmingly because we don't want our child to be excluded from things kids do or excluded from treats other kids have. In short, we don't want our child to be treated different because she's not different. She just has different medical requirements when it comes to food. So trips out are planned with military precision, phoning ahead to cafes, events, to find out if your child can be accommodated or catered for, taking drinks and snacks with you in case you can't get anything while you're out, and always having something in your bag to help mask a disappointment when someone forgets your child can't have something they're sharing out. Children's parties require consultation with hosts to find out what food will be available so you can try to replicate a gluten-free version, even down to the party bag treats, making sure club leaders always have something for snacks and sometimes even sending your child to someone's house for tea with their own food. Cake sales and treats at school also need to be factored in to avoid disappointment for your child. We are very lucky and we have a number of very good friends and family who will go beyond what is necessary to make our daughter feel included. Recently, she came away from a party with a box of gluten-free cakes while everyone else just got a slice of the birthday cake. Her brownie pack leaders have been so supportive and have made it their personal mission to ensure she can participate in sleepovers, day trips to Camelot, Chester Zoo, Knowlesy Safari Park and even three days in Blackpool last October without us worrying about food and her health. And we are grateful. We're thankful for people who make the effort. It makes up for the eye-rolling and muttering of fussy eater, of fussy parent and the times when we know our daughter is left out of something because someone misunderstands the disease or doesn't want to ask a question. Celiac disease does not define our daughter, but it has given her maturity and resilience beyond her 10 years, as she's had to learn to get on with her diagnosis. Her little sister and close friends just accept her food is often different and will get excited when they find something that they're eating is gluten-free because they know they can share it with her. For any parent facing celiac disease as a diagnosis for their child, the challenges of a gluten-free diet will always be compensated by seeing your child healthy once more. The alternative is truly too awful to go back to. Well, our guest this afternoon is Sandy Highton, founder of the Doolittle's Animal Therapy Organisation. Sandy, thank you very much for being here. Just tell me, first of all, about the two other little guests you brought with you. 
Okay, we had a lovely surprise. Um, I brought Robbie the rabbit in, who's actually the son of the Guinness Book of World Record, Darius. Um, so that was a lovely surprise, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> it, was. it was a little and, bit exciting. Um, a little spiky mammal called Mr. Nosy. Um, so he's come out and said hello to everybody. So um, I hope that was OK. But I thought I'd give you a bit of animal therapy before we started. And it was really interesting, actually, because the reaction you got from everyone was just everyone cooing over them, wanting to hold them, stroke them and whatever. And you said that is animal therapy. There's no more to it than that. Absolutely. I mean, if I had just walked in, I'm sure we would have had a lovely chat about animals and what we're going to talk about. But to break the ice for everybody and for us all to just suddenly bond, um, it's those little animals that work between us. So, Well, Robbie's not so little, is he? No, he is not. <laughs> no. If you go to the Women Today Facebook page, there is a picture of Robbie and uh, Mr Nosy on there. Um, I don't know whether you'll be leaving with him, just to let you know uh, <laughs> at the moment. But just tell me, Sandy, what exactly Doolittles is about? Okay. Um, Doolittles is about... Um, bringing animals um, to the public, be it through uh, special needs or um, adult services, um, schools, um, the list is endless. Um, And it is about bringing animals to have a gateway to communication and expression of um, emotion and releasing anxiety and not being judged for what you look like or what colour you are or what size you are. It's about being loved by that animal. Um, and we have many children have birthday cakes made after our animals simply because they have fallen in love with them. And where did the idea first come from for this? It's very personal. Um, I, I, I've been asked this many times, and I was only thinking this morning before I came here, and I thought, you know, where did this start? And my lovely parents, mum um, um, and dad, um, they brought us up on a farm, and um, it was an awesome upbringing. And um, on that basis you know I was introduced to animals I didn't know a life without animals um, I, but Doolittles itself it came about because a member of my family um, had severe learning difficulties and dyslexia and it brought great frustration um, anger um, feeling inadequate and it was on the basis of watching him with his dog that um, his lovely little Macy that he actually started to um, express his feelings and I sometimes used to like creep up the stairs and, and listen to him talking to the dog and saying things to the dog that he couldn't have ever said to me. So um, I have to say on that basis, I, I started to think, well, you know, there's something in this. And I, how, how much research has been done in this area to sort of back up what you're saying? Um, I did a lot of research before I founded Doolittles um, because I wanted to, you know, check out really that on the Isle of Man, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Isle of Man, but it was a bit of out the box um, therapy for children, particularly, um, you know, dogs. It, it's quite common to work with dogs as a form of animal therapy, but there isn't an organisation um, within the UK either that actually works with guinea pigs. Birds, hedgehogs, rabbits. Um, yeah, so that was a bit quirky, I suppose. What is your house <laughs> like, Sandy? Is it a completely chaotic mass of just animals everywhere? <laughs> you can tell us. But I do have quarters that are quite normal. Um. <laughs> do you think of your animals as extra children? Because I know you've got three children, but are they all your babies? They are all my babies. Um, and it was said to me that as a child left the home, another two animals came in, so... <laughs> Uh, that sort of explains it as well. And it's it's a need to care for them as well. So I enjoy that aspect of it because, you know, going out and, and giving doolittles out to the public is one thing, but the care continues for those animals when I get home. Now, you, you talked about um, your particular experience with working with special needs. Now, tell me about uh, this book that's been written. It's called Bumble Big Ears and a Boy Called Eddie. How did that come about? Um, that was just an amazing Um, situation that took place that we couldn't have expected the result. We were called um, from a school at the south of the island to um, a young boy who was very young and he had never spoken a word and he was mute. Um, They had tried all sorts of different, you know, um, special needs, um, sort of psychology, uh, bringing in special teachers, checking that he wasn't deaf. Um, or the route that you would go through um, and they couldn't find anything so they said this is sort of like a last resort and um, and again out of the box but would you come in so 
um, it was very important that this boy wasn't singled out. So I didn't just want to work with him on a one-to-one. So I said, can we involve the whole class, which we did. Um, so in goes all the singing canary and the, um, the guinea pigs and the rabbits and everything. Um, and this particular rabbit, Bumble Biggies, actually just jumped on this little boy's knee. And um, none of us at the time, I didn't realise that this was the boy. Um, but this rabbit, Bumble Biggies, actually stayed on his knee for over an hour. And all the children um, are fascinated by the names of the animals because, you know, Rollo and Crunchy and Sir Piggy Popcorn and Captain Nutmeg and Mr Nosy and Banana and they've all got these daft names and that's part of the therapy because they start to laugh and as soon as anybody laughs that releases, you know, a, you know, a great feeling and we call it a happy feeling. Um, but this rabbit just stayed on this little boy's knee. So unfortunately the rest of the class didn't really get a chance with him. <laughs> but um, it was actually on our leaving, the classroom, um, when we were putting all the animals back in their cages, this um, little boy just jumped off his chair and shouted Bumble. And I still get the hairs going up on the back of my neck when I, I think of that. It was a very magical time. Um, and it also showed um, us all in the room at that time that, you know, that was the trigger for him. That was a very powerful moment of animal therapy. Um, and I'm not saying that that would work for, for everybody, um, but it worked for him. So it was about six months after I was sat on my own and I just thought I've got to do something about this. We brought the book together with the help of quite a few people um, and um, 80 illustrations from children within the special needs department. I contacted Sue Marriott and she was totally up for it. So I spent six months travelling around all the schools, taking all the animals, particularly the characters in the book, um, because there's a, a lovely little guinea pig in there called Giggles too. Um, and all the children started drawing um, and we had a wonderful special needs art exhibition thank you to John Shakespeare at the Strand Um, and it went on for five days and it was just lovely and all the children from the schools came day by day to see their artwork and they were so proud and I think the most important thing about any child that feels different um, is to just you know um have a happy feeling about something that they achieved and uh, that's really what i wanted to do for these children as well and it's not just children you work with because Mm. you you work with older people as well people with dementia yeah dementia is quite important as well our singing canary um banana he works with a man that's had a stroke and has got dementia um and he used to feed the birds outside his home um and he had to go into care in the end so we work quite regularly with him and um he used to sing to the birds and when he had a stroke he couldn't do that anymore so um, I went in with Banana and um, he was just like transfixed by this little bird that had arrived into where he's now living um, and he started to try and whistle to the bird and it didn't work the first time but on the third therapy session he started to use his muscles in his face and start to sing to the canary and that again was an, an awesome thing to see and, and watch and, and he, he cried and it really Uh, brought out emotion in him that sometimes when you think you've given up it just takes one tiny tiny little bird to allow you to start to whistle again. Sandy you believe that on some level anybody can benefit uh, from a form of animal therapy and we're going to be talking about the importance of pets a little bit later. I'm going to be honest right my husband is not an animal person you must come across people who are like that how do you handle them? Because I'm, I'm sure people can be quite sceptical about it. Yeah, that has happened. We've had children, that not all children just love animals. Um, if they sense a fear in their parents um, as to, oh, mum doesn't like a dog or dad doesn't like a cat or they don't like a guinea pig because, you know, they might smell or something. <laughs> um, they, they have that fear as well. It's passed on. Um, and when I was running Doolittles at Silverdale, um, I saw that a lot because um, I had a lot of you know, people come in and come through and some would say, oh, I'm going to stand here. The children want to hold an animal, but I really am not interested. But it's incredible that when they see their kids having such joy, holding, stroking, grooming and feeding a guinea pig, they then say, oh, it's not so bad after all. And then they may then explain that they had some sort of trauma when they were a child or they were bit by a guinea pig or a rabbit or, you know, there's a reason why they don't want to interact with animals anymore. So um, they overcome their fear often when they come um, and work with us or they come to one of our public events. Yeah. 
Well, Sandy, thank you very much for being our guest this afternoon. Big thank you for bringing in Robbie and Mr Nosy. Joe was completely smitten. I was completely smitten, <laughs> although the hedgehog is a bit spiky, I have to say. <laughs> Funny that. Yeah. Women today. Hip Hip Parade, it's a weekday. That means at 2pm it's time for Women Today. There's Beth, there's Kate and there's Joe. They will tell you things that you may not know. It's on every weekday from 2 till 3. And it's not always just those three ladies. There's lots of guests and info too. It's a busy packed hour for you to listen to. It will make you laugh and make you cry. But they will always explain why. You can contact them by letter or email. You could even send it on the boat, assuming it may sail. You can also send them a text. It's nearing the end of the show. It's time for the Chica Banter bit with Alex. Soon it's 3pm and it's time to go. But don't be sad because the Women Today team will be back tomorrow. Love, CC, age 8. Women who are the first in their fields. It's the topic of a new photography exhibition being put together by experienced photographer Anita Corbin. The collection is about women's achievements and one woman's exploration through the camera lens that tries to answer the question, how will women be remembered? Well, one of the island's most oppressive women is taking part. No, it's not Joe. It's Carolyn Sells, the first woman ever to win a solo motorcycle race on the island's TT mountain course, and she's been selected to have her portrait taken. Carolyn won the ultra lightweight race during the two 2009 Mounts Grand Prix and was presented with a commemorative silver salver from the Isle of Man government in honour of her achievement. She also holds a Guinness World Record for the feat. The photos were taken last week and photographer Anita has been telling Kate Moore. I've been a photographer all my life and um, I was approaching my 50th birthday and I kept thinking what am I going to be remembered for? I mean I've photographed all over the world on assignment but it's always been for a magazine or for some other reason and um, I thought I'd love to leave a body of work behind me that you know 100 years down the road people would say oh she did this amazing project on first women and I kept hearing about first women on the radio and on the new in the news and I kept wondering well where will we ever see this collection of amazing first women trailblazers because in London you have you know a lot of statues but mainly of men and uh, that was um, the, the art of the time I guess but now, you know, contemporary photography allows us to make photographs uh, in a much more direct way, really, because, well, there's no cost involved for a start, apart from getting to the Isle of Man. <laughs> How did you get involved in photography in the first place? I was um, at my primary school and I went on a holiday to the I- to Ireland and uh, I entered a competition with a, with a photograph of um, St Kevin's Tower in Ireland and I won and I was only 10 and I think that has really spurred me on because I'd had been surrounded by photographs all my life. My grandfather on my mother's side was a really really keen amateur and my father was a horticultural photographer and so as I grew up around photography and my father actually made uh, a living out of being a horticultural photographer although that wasn't his job. He had a job and then he did that as well. So So it was in the blood. It's in the blood yes definitely in the blood. So we're talking about first women and these are those are women who were the first in their specific field yeah that's right I, I wanted to photograph women who had broken barriers trailblazing women that had broken through sometimes hundreds of years of male dominance uh, for instance as a woman who is at the top of her profession in the insurance world and she broke a record of 326 years of male dominance within her, you know, in her, where she works. So I thought it's really worth celebrating this. You know, it's not going to happen again. Once a first, always a first. So really, it was a question of capturing those first whilst they're still alive. Some of them, I mean, one of my first was 101 when I photographed her. Wow. Yeah, Edith Kent. Uh, she, she was the first woman to get equal pay in the Plymouth Dockyard and, and maybe even equal pay in the whole country. So um, yeah, it's a collection, it's a, a range of different subjects, so music, art, um, education, hist- medicine, employment, such as um, engineering. So it gives me a, a, a huge range of, of opportunities. Have you always been interested in women who, who do kind of extraordinary things? Yeah, as a young photographer, when I first started out, I was very fortunate that I had um, a scholarship with Sunday Times magazine. And um, I was actually awarded that because of a series of portraits that I did on girls in sport. So girls that were work playing sport that was, at that time, 1980, not expected to be in a, in a field like a football or frisbee or karate, um, skateboarding. They were all kind of 
boys' sports, but I've sought out the the young girls that were were breaking barriers then in 1980. So yeah, I guess it's always been in my blood to to make uh, positive images of women and girls. You know, I feel that's a really important part of what I'm doing as a photographer. And, um, you know, to kind of counteract and challenge a little bit of the, the status quo. Of course, you are on the Isle of Man because you're taking a photograph, a series of portraits of one of our own. Yes, I was um, tipped off, if you like, to, to photograph the first woman who has won the Manx Grand Prix ever and probably for a long time the only woman. And uh, so I, I was actually um, told about Carolyn Sells by, by a friend of mine who said, you've got to, he's mad about TT and by old bikes, and he said, you've got to get Carolyn, you've got to get her. She's she's just done this incredible uh, first. And so I I had a, you know looked her up on the uh, internet and we started to correspond. And um, Carolyn just had some young, so just had twins. So I said, well, let's leave it a little while till you, you know, feel a bit more like you want to get in front of the camera. And um, so now... Now, yeah, I came over first time on the island and it's uh, been fantastic. And where have you been taking photographs? Um, well, this morning we set off to the museum, Murray's Museum, and um, very kindly let us um, rearrange his front uh, area and we got the bike in there, her, the bike that she won on. Luckily, I was able to take some portraits, which I wanted to do, of Carolyn as a mum on the bike. So she had two babies, in one in each arm, and her leathers on. So I wanted to sort of portray women who are first also have you know ordinary lives working you know as mums and and have working lives and um the contrast between sort of what she's achieved on on the track you know the speeds that she's been hurtling around the track at 170 80 180 miles per hour and now you know now she's got the babies and uh, life changes but we're able to do all sorts of things and you know i don't think i think for women there's always an opportunity to do your heart's sole purpose you know as long as you give yourself um, the opportunity to to find it how are these images going to be exhibited in 2018 well the idea is to have 100 portraits um, on the walls in one space so that you can juxtapose young women with older women uh, women working in, the, in engineering with um, a musician, different races, different ages. So, you know, to give a sort of mixture of, of um, what women have achieved in the last hundred years. This is like a, a kind of impact, the impact of women, my take on it anyway. It's not a definitive list. I say that list is growing and um, I'm not sort of seeking to, to, to be a, have a complete list because I want to carry on doing the portraits even after 2018. That's photographer Anita Corbin speaking to Kate there about photography collection First Women. Well, earlier this afternoon, Kate spoke to Carolyn and asked how she felt to be chosen as a first woman. Really flattered, actually. I mean, at first I didn't know much about it, but when I looked into her website and the stuff that she's doing, I was really, really, really flattered, to be honest. I'm proud, very proud. And you actually have a degree that's kind of relevant to this, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I have a, a fine art degree. After my degree, I went on to work in television and film. For started off in props and I was a, an art director. So it's it's kind of relates to the stuff that she's doing because she's setting up a photographic portrait, you know, that tells a story about the person that's in it. So if it, it kind of ties in with what I used to do. <laughs> Did it make you feel a little bit more comfortable in front of the camera? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm never that comfortable in front of the camera, but, you know, I enjoyed it, to be honest. I enjoyed it more than I thought I was going <laughs> to. This afternoon, we are talking about Parkinson's. What is it like living with a disease? What is it like living with a sufferer? Well, we're joined in the studio by Chair of the Parkinson's Disease Society, Isle of Man, Pamela Shimwell Mayo, OBE, and fundraiser for the Society, Fenella Farrer, whose husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's around eight years ago at the age of 55. Um, Fenella, you say you had to force your husband, Rob, to go to the doctor. What was it that was happening with him? Well, he, he was coming home from work absolutely whacked absolutely washed out and sitting in the chair holding on to his hand but I had actually seen the tremor a little while before actually quite a few months before and we were away on holiday and I just noticed the slightest tremor and I looked and I thought no I was mistaken because as soon as I saw it because of course Rob's mother had Parkinson's and I have an aunt who had Parkinson's, but um, she had it for a very long time, and she she got it in her 
early 40s and she died at 77 so she had it for quite a long while but and so I just I looked at it and I, my heart stopped and I thought and I watched for another there wasn't any I thought I was mistaken but then after a month or a few months he started holding on to his hand and I thought he's got Parkinson's and I just had I kept saying I didn't want to come out and boldly say you've got Parkinson's and I was thinking he must know but he did know but he just didn't want me to know and we, we, a few times I said now I, I don't think you're awfully well I think you really need to go to the doctor and he said used to say yes I will and this went on for a while until I just lost it with my temper with him and told him he had to go so he did so he did go to the doctor yes. he got that diagnosis how did you both deal with that well, at first it wasn't too bad because you don't, you have to wait to go to the specialist and we sort of, we knew, knew it was there, but well, once it was confirmed by the specialist, even though we both knew he had it, it's a shock. I, I It sounds ridiculous, but it is a shock. Um, and I think, well, I think we have coped with it quite well but um, not all the time I mean, and sometimes I feel you know really I feel really resentful to be quite honest and I think it's so stopped us doing the things that we we enjoyed together you know and we, we loved our holidays and we we actually are going to go on a holiday this year later on but we haven't really been on oh we used to go for a fortnight we haven't done that been for an odd weekend. What about on a day-to-day -to -day level because you you care for Rob but you're also working part-time as well how does how do you manage all that? Um, well I, <laughs> I just do with great difficulty but I like to go out to work because it gives me a complete break I don't even think about Parkinson's then when I'm away from my husband I don't think about Parkinson's um, you know, I, I just get on with what I'm doing and, and I, I, it does, it, and it, I say it keeps me sane. <laughs> We're also joined, as I say, uh, by Chair of the Parkinson's Disease Society, Isle of Man, Pamela Shimwell Mayo. I gave you an OBE before, I know it's an MBE, apologies for that. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Pamela, um, your husband had Parkinson's for 30 yes. years. Yes. Um, tell me about your experience. Well... Very like Fenella, except I didn't notice he had it, this little shake in his hand, because I was looking after two young children, eight and eleven. And uh, I had been injured also in a bomb blast in Northern Ireland. We'd all been in a car when someone let off a bomb, and the children ended up coming over my head in the car. But um, I wasn't injured in the way you could see it. I was able to drive and get back to the hotel, and um, after I came out of hospital, um, I was flat on my back for three months and I wanted to put something back charity-wise to the hospital. So I arranged a fashion show at the Palace Hotel and invited Dr. Lamming, who was the consultant looking after me, and Richard Hamm, the doctor, and various other medical people. And um, it was after that that Dr. Lamming said to me, we think Derek could be in the early stages of Parkinson's. They'd been sitting at a table for dinner with him at the Palace Hotel and they had noticed him having slight difficulty cutting his food. And um, they obviously had a chat and they, they rang me the next day. Meanwhile, he'd flown to Belfast on business and uh, I didn't want to say anything, so I told a white lie. I said I would meet him at the airport because the consultant wanted to see how my back was repairing and we drove to the doctors and um, they examined me and then asked Derek to put his hands out in front of him and they got hold of the hands Bob Lamming no Richard Ham got hold of his hands and said we think you're in the early stages of Parkinson's and it was a shock because I hadn't noticed it but of course straight afterwards I did notice little things but it's amazing when you are diagnosed, how you can go on continuing with your life. I 
vowed that we'd have holidays like Fenella did. My husband had to fly to Belfast most weeks because he was an inventor of textile machinery. And uh, he went on for another, oh, 15 years before we told anyone. Why was that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a private illness. It's not something you want to tell everybody. It's different to heart or cancer. It's something you can live with for quite a long time before it is noticed. And sadly, at about the 15-year stage, he started falling. And it was the year the Queen came to the Isle of Man and there were a lot of functions to go to. And um, he said to me, I don't think I'm going to go. I think it's time we told family and friends I've got Parkinson's disease because they're beginning to think I'm drunk if I go somewhere and then I stumble. It's embarrassing. And I, I can think of quite a few occasions um, once leaving... Um, a dinner in Castletown and we were in the hall ready to leave and suddenly he did a wobbly as I called it hit the grandfather clock and the grandfather clock started chiming madly <laughs> and we laugh about it for well, many years but it was about that time when he said enough is enough we're going to have to tell people I've got Parkinson's because they they I don't want them to think I'm drunk because he was teetotal anyway he never touched alcohol <laughs> Fenella, what do you think about um, what Pamela said there about it being a private illness? How did you and Rob cope with telling people about well, it? Well, once he was diagnosed, um, Rob, it was easier because his mother had had it. And we told family straight away. And um, and we just told our close friends. And now everybody knows. And I think that's what's wrong with Parkinson's, the fact that it's hidden. If more people said what you know talked about Parkinson's maybe we'd get maybe medication would move faster because there are a lot of people with Parkinson's one person every hour in Britain is diagnosed with Parkinson's to find out firsthand what it's like living with the disease we're also now joined by Fiona Baxter when did you first find out you had Parkinson's about 14 years ago just after my 50th birthday and what was the diagnosis like for you what is it meant for you it's um, It does change your life quite a bit because you can't do half the things you want to do. But um, I'm very positive about it. I, I am a half pint full, not half pint empty type person. So I try, try not to let it get on top of me too much. And in your day to day life, how are you affected? Well, I had to give up work because I couldn't cope. You get very, very tired. That's when you find out what fatigue really means, because being tired is one thing. Fatigue is where you just literally can't do anything. Um, but I, I, I do check tutor on a course for Live Well, Stay Well, which is for people with long-term conditions, and that helps doing voluntary work and helping other people makes it very positive for you. What was the reaction like from your friends and family to your diagnosis? Um, well, I was all a bit shocked because the first thing I said to the doctor was, I'm too young, but Parkinson's um, can hit anybody at any age, not just an old person. So, But um, I, just, I found out very, very quickly, actually, within three months so I and I immediately told everybody what I had so they knew why I was shaking at that stage or not walking like, like a bit drunk so I told everybody straight away as soon as I found out. Because it's something that both Fenella and Pamela mentioned earlier was the the embarrassment that come come along with it because people who who don't know who may just see you walking down the street don't understand what's happening with you. Yes when you're in shop right at 10 o'clock in the morning trying to open a shop and carry a bag and you've got the shakes, you know, people think you've got, you, you know, you're, you're drunk or something like that. So I felt it was easier to tell everybody. It's easier for other people to accept it as well. They know exactly what you've got. So I am responsible for going out all around the country to find um, all of the lovely talent that comes on the show. And what a job that is. How long have you been doing it for? Um, I've been doing it for a few years. Um, this is my first series on X Factor, but I've done Britain's Got Talent and other kind of singing shows in the past as well. And how close do you get to those judges? Very close. <laughs> so who is the best? Um, they're all absolutely wonderful. Um, all lovely people and, and good fun as well. So it's fab. 
Why have you decided to come to the Isle of Man this year? Um, obviously, um, it's quite an expense and quite a journey for people from Isle of Man to get across and get to maybe Manchester or wherever the closest auditions are. So it's just to make the auditions really accessible and just so that everyone can get involved and everyone can get a chance. If they've ever been thinking about it, then now's their time. We're on their doorstep. So it's just to get everyone involved and get them down and, and singing. And how do you cope when you actually do get people that really can't sing? Um, I think that the great thing about X Factor is that it's a big entertainment show, it's fun, we celebrate everything from the voice to the look to kind of the entertainment, um, so it's fun, it's great fun, um, we love meeting everyone that comes to audition and we've got loads of time for everyone so um, it's just really fun and great to watch. And just how are we getting on today? The talent has been amazing, yeah we're really impressed with the Isle of Man so far um, and we just hope it continues all day and I'm sure it will. Yeah, I'm Daz Bartley from Ramsey. Yeah, I'm in a wheelchair and I'm doing the X Factor. Fair play. And what is it that makes you want to do this? I don't know. I've decided to get up one morning and go, yeah, well, then I'll give it a try. Because I was going to do a thingy last year. Um, Britain's Got Talent and I didn't get through to that. So you've got to try them all, haven't you? And what is it you're going to be singing? Uh, Budapest by George Ezra. Perfect. Yeah. Are you nervous? No, not really. Not at the minute. My name is Sarah Bannister and I'm from Ramsey. And how long have you been singing for, Sarah? Um, since I was little, you know, do a lot of karaoke and competitions in Douglas and, you know, wherever I can find it, I'll do it. I was actually the first one in this morning. I was nervous when I went in, but I was more nervous when I come out. My knees were like jelly. I'm Josh and I'm 18 at school at the minute. So what makes you want to audition today or you're a little bit nervous and you're not sure right now? Um, well, I love singing and I'm always singing at home, like wherever I am. So, um... I thought I'd give it a go. And has anyone pushed you into this, or is it just your own decision? Um, it's my own decision at first, but then um, my mum put it on Facebook, so kind of the whole island found out, so <laughs> it's a bit of pressure to do it, yeah. How are you feeling right now? Um, I don't really know if I want to do it at the minute, <laughs> but nervous. What song would you be singing? I'm not, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Um, price tag, All of Me, or Black and Gold or something, I'm not too sure yet. Well, I'm going to wait around and just make sure that you do go in there, because I think you've probably got the X Factor for sure. <laughs> Thanks. You have no idea how good you are. Really? That was incredible. Oh, God, thanks. That's... Josh, how are you feeling? Um, well, I've got a really dry mouth now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm quite relieved I did it, actually. I'm so proud of you for doing it because obviously it's a really nerve-wracking thing so you must be delighted that you have done it. Yeah, I am definitely glad I gave it a go anyway. If the fish swam out of the ocean and grew legs and they started walking and the apes climbed down from the trees and grew tall and they started talking and the stars fell out of the sky and my tears rolled into the ocean well, now I'm looking for a reason why You went and set my world into motion Cause if you're not really... Thanks as always to our amazing guests. And as ever, it's never too late for you to get involved. Head over to Facebook, find the Women Today Facebook page and you can comment there or you can follow us at MR Women Today on Twitter and you can listen again to the full programmes on manxradio.com or join us every weekday live from just after two o'clock. next to you Black and gold, black and gold, black and gold. Women Today, brought to you by citywing.com for your next flight away.